Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation, or DIC. DIC essentially begins always with an underlying disorder. And I'll give examples of that a little later. What this does, it sets off a coagulation cascade. And this coagulation cascade essentially results in a lot of blood clots being formed. Eventually what happens is the clotting factors that are involved in this coagulation cascade get all used up. And when that happens, you have a situation of bleeding. So this is an extremely brief summary of DIC and I hope to elaborate on it further. So what is this coagulation cascade? I think it's important to discuss it to understand. Coagulation cascade or coagulation pathway. Okay, well in the very beginning you have something known as TF, tissue factor. Now tissue factor is a protein and it's in uh, found in our tissue and the tissue factor is responsible for getting this cascade started and the very first thing that happens in my diagram at least is prothrombin is converted to thrombin and then thrombin helps convert fibrinogen to fibrin and then the fibrin then goes on to develop help develop a stable fibrin blood clot now a few things when fibrinogen is converted to fibrin these byproducts come off and those are called FDPs this is very important they're called fibrinogen degradation products so that's important now remember the tissue factor is the bad guy here that is the protein that's in the tissue that's going to get this coagulation cascade started why would that happen what are the causes of DIC and why do they get the coagulation started well whenever you have a disease or something that happens that causes tissue damage the exposure of this tissue to the blood stream will set off the coagulation cascade in DIC. Now the reason is because tissue contains tissue factor. So I'll give you three examples. The first example of a primary cause of DIC is OBGYN complications. And the reason is because in OBGYN complications you have something known as placental tissue and this tissue from the placenta contains tissue factor. That tissue factor then enters the circulation and it sets off the coagulation cascade. The next example of uh, a primary disorder that can cause DIC is infection and in particular infection with gram negative organisms and the reason is because gram negative bugs release an endotoxin and that endotoxin generates and exposes tissue factor very important and that tissue factor of course then goes on to initiate or start that coagulation cascade another uh, example the third one that I wanted to give is cancer cancer can also be a primary reason why somebody can develop DIC why because tumor cells can also express and release tissue factor so please keep that in mind 
Now let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology. DIC has two types. There's the slow DIC, known as slowly evolving. And then more commonly, you have the severe and rapidly evolving DIC. Now these two types of DICs have different presentation. The first one primarily presents with blood clots. So for example, deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. That will be the presenting symptom. More commonly though, so you have severely rapid, uh, e rapidly evolving DIC and that will present as bleeding. And the reason is because all the coagulation factors along with fibrinogen have been depleted. So keep those two types in mind. Now let's talk a little bit about the symptoms. Well the symptoms really are associated really with the type. If it's a slowly evolving DIC then you will have uh, symptoms of DVT, symptoms of pulmonary embolism. If it's rapidly uh, evolving DIC, then you'll have a presentation of bleeding, ecchymosis, and uh, the bleeding will be either from the GI tract or even from the skin puncture sites during a hospitalization wherever the patient has been punctured, injection sites for example, there will be bleeding from there. So now, diagnosis. Something happened in the patient and now they've either developed a blood clot or severe bleeding and you want to make sure that this indeed is DIC. So what are the lab tests? Well, fortunately the results are the same for slowly evolving and rapidly evolving DIC. They're just a bit more extreme and rapidly evolving. So you're going to measure the PT, which is the thrombin time, the PTT, partial thromboplastin time, fibrinogen, and very important, the fibrin degradation products that I drew in the first part of the video. So, what will it show? PT will be elevated, but in rapidly evolving DIC it will be even more elevated. PTT will also be elevated, but in rapidly evolving DIC it would be even greater. Fibrinogen will be decreased. Fibrin degradation products will be increased. And there's one more lab value I'd want to definitely mention, and that's the platelet count. Platelets in both will be decreased, but they will be more decreased in rapidly evolving DIC. And one example of a fibrin degradation product is called D-dimer, just in case that show, shows up on a licensing exam and you're wondering what exactly that is. That's just one of the types of fibrin degradation products. In terms of treatment, well, of course, you have to treat the underlying cause. What is the reason um, this person developed DIC? For example, if they developed it because of an infection, then, you know, you would give antibiotics. If they developed it because uh, they had some sort of uh, OBGYN complication, then you need to remove the tissue uh, that's placental tissue that's caused the DIC, things like that. But generally speaking, if the person has uh, severe bleeding with DIC, you need to give replacement therapy. And that involves giving platelet transfusions, fresh frozen plasma, and also clotting factors. In contrast, if the patient has a situation of blood clots, which is the slowly evolving type of DIC, then you would treat that by giving heparin which is of course uh, anticoagulation therapy. So that is the cornerstone of treatment. 
Now let's take a look at a few vignettes. A one-year-old boy presents with sudden onset fever and vomiting. Findings include irritability, tachycardia, paler, cold extremities, diffuse skin rash, and abdominal petechiae, signs of meningeal irritation. Blood tests show leukocytosis, markedly decreased platelet count, increased PT-PTT, decreased fibrinogen, elevated fibrin degradation products, elevated BUN, and metabolic acidosis. Gram-negative cocci were found in the CSF, and meningeal cocci confirmed. Protein C activity is reduced. Most likely diagnosis is. Well, the lab values are highly pointing to DIC. Now, keep in mind, what is the reason this child developed it? What is the underlying disorder? Well, it's infection. And infection with what? With a gram-negative organism. And just in case you forgot, you, in gram-negative infections, the gram-negative endotoxin generates and exposes uh, the tissue factor that sets off the cascade uh, involved in DIC. Next question simply states, which of the following measures which you would be seen in a patient with DIC? Basically, they're saying, you know, what type of lab tests? Well, PT and PTT are both elevated. So, let's see. We'll just keep going. And fibrinogen is decreased. So, whichever one fits that category, not E, it looks like it's D. And then finally, you are called to see a 72 year old man with metastatic pancreatic adenocarcinoma who was admitted to the hospital for palliative gastrojejunostomy. His hospital course has been unremarkable, but today he developed hematemesis. His current meds include multivitamins, folate, and a fentanyl patch. When you arrive at his room, you see a thin, jaundiced man with an NG tube in place and multiple petechiae and dried blood around his nares and mouth. Temperature is 98, blood pressure is 98, pulse is 103, respiration is 25. His faint crackles bilaterally. The remainder of the exam is unremarkable. Platelet count is down to 45,000 from 120,000 three days earlier. Primary oncologist is concerned that the patient has developed DIC. The most appropriate next step is. Well, remember, cancer is one of the uh, causes of DIC because the tumor cells express and release uh, the tissue factor. And that tissue factor, of course, is responsible for getting that uh, coagulation cascade going. Uh, that is the fundamental uh, problem in DIC. So what should we do here? Well, we need to figure out if this patient's presentation is indeed DIC. So which lab tests would be helpful is what they're asking. And the most important ones, of course, are the PT and the PTT. And those are listed as choice B.